this is, uh, I think, uh, something like the sixth or the seventh uh, Dennis Anderson uh, uh, lecture. Um, and we've had uh, an august uh, group uh, of, uh, uh, of individuals who've given this talk over, over the last, uh, uh, I think it's nine years now uh, since, uh, since Dennis uh, actually sadly passed away. Uh, we've, we've had present and former uh, uh, cabinet ministers. Uh, we've had CEOs of large companies. Uh, we've had the, uh, the luminaries of the likes uh, of, uh, of Lord Stern. Uh, and so I'm absolutely delighted uh, that we are able to uh, welcome this evening uh, Spencer Dale, um, who you can all see from the very large uh, screens all around behind me, is uh, Chief Economist um, at BP. I think that um, Spencer's going to provide an introduction himself um, to, uh, to his talk, so I'm not going to say anything further ab about that. Um, Spencer joined BP um, uh, in 2014. Uh, he had a long uh, and extremely distinguished uh, uh, first career, if you like, um, at the Bank of England. Uh, and during his, his, his 20 plus years there, he, he held a wide range of roles, including chief economist, head of economic forecasting. He was a member of the Monetary Policy Committee. Uh, and he also served as a senior advisor at uh, the US Fe Federal Reserve uh, Board of Governors. So a fascinating transition, I think, from the world of, of macroeconomics uh, to the world of energy economics uh, and policy. Um, we're, we're running for an hour or so this evening. I think Spencer's going to talk for uh, half an hour or 40 minutes, uh, and then we're going to take some questions. And then we have, as, as we usually do, a wonderful selection of Imperial College crisps, peanuts, olives, and, uh, and fine wines. Uh, Spencer, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. So no pressure. I'm the only one keeping you between you and I'm the only one between you and the crisp. So I'll uh, I'll take that in, in mind. Um, uh, thank you, Rob. Thank you all for giving up your time to, to come here um, this evening. Uh, this is an extraordinarily busy time for everybody. Most people are rushing around, uh, thinking about getting ready for the for Christmas, uh, exams, uh, and too many drinks parties. So I appreciate everybody sparing the time uh, to come here this evening. It's a great honour for me uh, to present the Dennis Anderson Lecture. I'm afraid I didn't know uh, Professor Anderson. As, as Rob indicated um, in his, his opening remarks, I'm relatively new to the world of energy. I only moved to BP three years ago um, after spending the majority of my career in central banking. So given that, after agreeing to present tonight's lecture, I asked Rob to send me some background about Dennis um, and his work. That's when I realized my fatal mistake. I should have asked for the background material before I said yes um, to giving the lecture. I am hopelessly ill-qualified uh, to give a lecture in Professor Anderson's um, name. For those of you who are not familiar with Dennis Anderson's career, he originally trained and worked as a nuclear engineer. If that wasn't enough, he then later studied economics and worked in various senior roles as an economist at the World Bank and then, and then as Shell's uh, chief economist. During much, much of his work during that period, and I think again also subsequently his time here at Imperial, was focused on environmental problems and then the important role that innovation and technology can play um, in trying to in, in tackling uh, those problems. Unfortunately, my expertise is not in, environment, in, in environmental economics, and I don't have the sort of background in engineering that will allow me to do in any depth to think about the role that innovation and technology can play in addressing some of those environmental issues. So what on earth am I doing here? Um, I think that's a very good question, and I suggest that we all go and ask Rob after the lecture um, to give us a good um, explanation for it. Um, grasping at straws, uh, the one area I do have in common uh, with Professor Anderson is we both spent significant amounts of our, of our working lives working as economists in policy institutions, trying to use economics to shape better policy. <laughs> 
Um, uh, Dennis Anderson done that uh, for many years at the World Bank. I did it uh, at both the, the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. And then, if you like, we both took that, that practical economics bent and then try and tried to set it to work in large oil companies. Uh, Dennis Anderson at uh, 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 Royal Dutch Shell and myself at BP. So in that spirit, the theme of my talk tonight is trying to think through the economics of some of the changes happening in global oil markets today and the implications this may have for both major oil producers and for long-run oil prices. The potential implications for economic policy in individual oil producers are substantial. And likewise, the future path of oil prices will have an important bearing on the evolution of the global energy system over the next 20 or 30 years, something I th which I think Dennis Anderson spent an awful long time of his career um, thinking about. So although a different line of work um, to his own, I hope Professor Anderson would have been interested in some of the implications of what I'm going to discuss um, tonight. The good news is that, by all accounts, uh, Dennis Anderson was such a kind and generous man, he would have said he was interested in what I had to say, even if he wasn't. Um, and so I hope, for the hope that you share that same generosity, um, I will talk about um, what I'm going to, to talk about tonight, which is on peak oil demand and long-run oil prices. And I should say, this is joint work with, uh, with Bassam Fatou, who's the director of the Oxford Institute of Energy Studies, and I hope, I'm sure many of you know Bassam um, well. And the, the genesis of this work was the sort of current focus and attention associated with the prospects um, of, of peak oil. And I'm going to argue today that I think the prospects of peak oil demand has really significant implications um, for, for global oil markets over the next 20 or 30 years. But I'm going to also argue that much of the attention on peak oil demand at the moment, I, I think, is misplaced. And in particular, at the moment, much of that attention on peak oil demand seems to be focused on trying to guess when exactly oil demand will peak. Um, you seem to be not be able to open a newspaper or read an article in an energy uh, magazine without a new executive or energy expert telling you that oil is going to peak in 2024 or 2033 or 2029 or so on. I think, um, I think th this focus on trying to, to guess when the peak of uh, when oil demand will peak is a relatively um, a futile exercise. I in part because relatively small change in, ass in assumptions can shift that, pr that timing of that peak around um, very significantly. Moreover, and I think far more importantly, the, in the intrinsic of comparative advantage that oil has as, a, as an energy source, particularly in terms of its energy intensity when used in the transportation system, means the world is likely to demand huge quantities of oil for many decades, even after once oil demand has actually peaked. Rather, for me, the real significance of, of peak oil demand is that it signifies a shift in paradigm, a regime shift, a shift from an age of scarcity to an age of abundance. And I think this shift in paradigm from scarcity to abundance has really significant implications um, for, for major oil producing economies around the world. And I think, I, and I will argue, you can already see that some of those implications playing out today in what we're seeing in the Middle East. And it also has major implications for long run oil prices, although I'm going to argue the implications are a little bit more nuanced uh, than, than perhaps might appear at first sight. So at least that's what I'm going to try and do over the next 30, uh, 30 or 35 minutes or so. So let me start. I, I start with a very simple chart on, on peak oil demand. And I drew this chart as a way, essentially, of venting my frustration about this obsession with trying to, peak, uh, trying to guess the peak in oil demand. So this just looks at global oil demand over the, next, over the last um, 50 years. And what I've done here is added up a range of external forecasts um, for oil demand going out over the next 25 years or so, out, out to 2040. Um, there's no great science in the, in, the, in the forecasts I picked here. I didn't sort of screen them first. What I thought it would be good to do is get a range of forecasts. So this includes major government organizations like the IEA, the EIA. It includes major 
um, energy consultancy firms um, such as Wood Mac, Pyra, uh, IHS, Sierra. It includes BP's own projections. It includes some investments banks like, um, like Citibanks. And what I want to do, I want to make, I want to draw two sort of key implications um, from this chart. First, the point at which oil demand um, peaks is, is highly uncertain. Some of these projections have oil demand peaking relatively quickly in the next five or ten years or so. Some of them have oil demand increasing, um, con continuing to increase, increase out to the next, uh, out to 2040. Many of the same consultancies produce a variety of different projections which will have oil demand peaking at many different points in time, um, and depending on the precise assumptions used. And if you play with any of these, these types of models, you can see relatively small shifts in assumptions about the pace of GDP growth, the pace at which vehicle efficiency improves, can easily shift the timing of this peak oil demand by 10 or 15 years. So why on earth do we have this cottage industry of executives and, and, and experts trying to predict whether it's going to be 30, 30, 2033 or 2039? We don't know because it depends on a whole heap of assumptions which we don't know about. Second, and I think even more importantly, even for those projections which have oil demand peaking over, the, over this forecast, they all expect oil demand um, to remain at very high levels out um, to 2040. And the underlying story here and the intuition for this is the comparative advantage, you know, the huge advantage that oil had in terms of its, particularly in terms of its energy intensity when using the transportation system means it's very hard to displace oil in any wholesale way. Sure, oil demand is likely to grow less quickly over the future. Sure, at some point it's likely to peak, but we're unlikely to see a very sharp decline in oil demand. I'm very happy to talk, um, at, um, well, I can bore for England on, on electric vehicles, and I'm happy to chat about um, electric vehicles in the Q&A. Just in terms of a summary th thing here, all of these projections have a view about electric vehicles. In nearly all of these projections, if I took their view and doubled it, it wouldn't cause a line to move out of that sort of broad fan. Oil, electric vehicles just is just not a game changer. The arithmetic of electric vehicles just is not a game changer for oil demand over this period. So you take any of these projections, uh, the, the only one which is different is the IEA 450 where you're starting to get some really big numbers. You take, other than that one, you take them and you double it, it wouldn't cause these things to move around. So these do take account of EVs, double them, this picture wouldn't look that, um, that significantly different. The most extreme, or the lowest profile here, is the, the IEA, um, the so-called IEA 450 scenario. Many of you um, will be familiar and used this scenario many times before. For those who aren't, you can think of this as a sort of workhorse scenario, which has now recently been updated, but it, it tells a pretty similar story, of a sort of backcast of what the energy system would need to do in, in order for carbon emissions to, have to follow a path which gives us a good chance of achieving the two degrees C um, climate target. So it's sort of it's a backward task. Uh, it's a backward, um, it's a back cast in that sense. But even in that scenario, it suggests that oil demand will be more than 80 million barrels a day in, in 2035. In nearly all of these other scenarios, even if they have oil demand peaking, um, they have um, the level of oil in 2040 is higher than the current um, level of oil. Just to put these pro profiles in some sort of context, what I've done here, what I've done here is just added this illustrative profile uh, and, uh, for oil supply and said, suppose we don't invest any, we make no more investments in oil production. We just stop in investing in oil today, and we assume that oil production declines at a 3% decline rate. In terms of decline rates, that's a relatively modest decline rate, but that, um, it, it serves a purpose. Well, you can see here, in that type of world, you see a, a big and ever-widening gap between the amount of oil that the world will be able to pro provide and the amount of oil that the world is likely to, to, to demand, at least compared to, uh, based on all of these outside um, um, projections. So the simple sort of point I wanted to make from this chart in terms of peak oil demand is, A, we don't know, and B, I don't really care. The world is likely to need an awful lot of oil for an awful long period of time. I, don't, I have no idea if it will be 100 million barrels. So for those who aren't familiar with the numbers, today the world produced about, consumed about 95 million barrels of oil today. 
I don't know if, if in, in, in 2035 that number's going to be 80 or 100, but I think I have a pretty good confidence that it's going to be a big number. And so the fact whether it reached some point of inflection between, between now and 2040 doesn't seem to me a sort of game-changing uh, question. Okay, so that's why peak oil demand isn't interesting. So why is peak oil demand um, interesting? I, th I think peak oil demand is interesting because, as I said, it, it represents this, this shift in regime from, it, from a world of scarcity, from an age, or if you like, from an age of scarcity to an age of abundance. So one way I was trying to think about how to best illustrate the sort of the views characterizing the age of scarcity. And as, as I was thinking about it, um, I literally, um, well, I didn't literally, my press office literally came across his speech, which was given by Sir David Still. It's not the politician Sir David Still. It's actually um, Sir David Still, who used to be um, chairman um, of BP. And he gave this speech um, in, in December of 1977, which I thought was quite good, since it's exactly 40 years ago to this month where he gave this speech. And, and this speech isn't trying to pick on somebody um, from 40 years ago. I think this is fairly characteristic of the, of the way people thought about scarcity in this period of time. You can see it in that first quote. The world is using up its store of oil and natural gas at, at an alarming rate. The fate of nations without sufficient energy is too awful to contemplate. And, 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 and so David, sort of a bit like today's cottage industry, made his own prediction about peak oil. In this case, it was peak oil supply, um, not peak oil demand. World oil, and it's actually world oil brackets production, may reach a plateau sometime in the 1980s. Thereafter, perhaps in the 1990s, it will start a long and slow um, decline. I should say that since um, Sir David um, made his prediction of, of oil production, uh, um, of oil peak oil, oil production's increased by about 50%. Predicting peak oil is a difficult thing to do. I put the third quote in, not really for the scarcity, but I thought I put the, the third quote in because I thought Professor Anderson may appreciate the words written here, if not quite um, the sentiment. So a key feature um, of, of Sir David Steele's speech was the importance of energy efficiency. So conservation now means insurance for the future. In, in the context of say, Sir David Steele's speech, his point was conservation now, energy efficiency now, is an insurance against running out of oil and gas in the future. Where I think if, we, if any of us wrote this um, statement today, conservation now or energy efficiency now is insurance against the risk of climate change in the future. So it's just, I thought it was just ironic how, how the, world, um, the world has moved over this period of time. We may write almost the same sentence, but mean almost an entire um, difference. So that was the age of scarcity. What do I mean by the age of abundance? And perhaps the simplest way of thinking about the age of abundance is in this chart. So the stacked bar chart to the left here is, provides BP's estimates of what is known as te technically recoverable oil resources. Now, technically recoverable oil resources are sort of what they say on the tin. They give you an estimate of the oil we think we could produce today based on the oil that we know exists today and today's technology. So it ignores the fact that tomorrow I will find more oil. It ignores the fact that tomorrow I will get better at extracting barrels of oil and just says, how much oil could I produce today, technically? Not all of that oil would be economic to recover, but it would be technically recoverable. And we estimate it's something like two and a half trillion barrels of oil. Now, I hate it when people say numbers like two and a half trillion barrels of oil, because I have no idea what two and a half trillion barrels of oil means. I mean, what, how do I think about two and a half trillion barrels? I'm not even sure I could actually write down two and a half trillion on a piece of paper and get all the noughts right. So how do I actually think about two and a half trillion barrels of oil? I think the simplest way to think about it is what it means relative to demand, which is shown on the right-hand side. Two and a half trillion barrels of oil is enough oil to meet the world's entire demand for oil out to 2050, more than twice over. So essentially, you can think of that green bar there as just a sum of that sort of one of those um, oil demand curves I showed you there, extended out to 2050, and you get this, you get a level of just over a trillion barrels of oil. We can produce today, with today's technology, 
more than enough oil to meet the world's entire demand for oil out to 2050, more than twice over. And as we go forward, this inequality is just going to get bigger and bigger. As we go forward and technology improves, that stack bar will just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And if anything, that green bar is likely to get smaller as technology um, improves. The world is not going to run out of oil. Now, as, as in some sense, we've known this for a long time. This is not some great revelation that I'm bringing to you today. There's sort of the sort of language and importance that Sir David still talked about energy scarcity 40 years ago hasn't been, isn't sort of significant today. But I would argue that it still has a sort of cast a shadow over the way oil markets behave um, today. So let me give you an example. I just talked about that today, um, the world today consumed and produced 95 million barrels of oil. Some of that oil was produced by, by low-cost um, producers, say in the Middle East, where they can produce a barrel of oil, many of them can produce a barrel of oil for $5 or less. But some of that oil was produced by high-cost producers in, no, in the North Sea or Canada, where the cost of producing that barrel of oil was five or even ten times higher. This is a really odd market. It's a really odd market. And not only was that today, that's been like that for years and years and years. I don't know any other market where somebody can produce the same good at five or ten times the cost of somebody else and not get competed out of the market. In any other market, the low-cost producer would use its comparative advantage to squeeze out the high-cost producer and, and gain market share. We don't see that in the oil market. Why don't we see that in the oil market? Because essentially the low-cost producers ration their oil supplies. They don't increase their oil production today or over a period of years. Instead, they prefer to operate at a rate of production, which means they can carry on producing at the same rate of production for many, many years. So the production to reserves, the reserves to production ratio of many of these low-cost producers is of the order of 70, 80, 90 years. They're producing at a rate which they can carry on doing that same rate for 70, 80, or 90 years. In a world of scarcity, this rationing makes sense. I mean, if you believe, really believe scarcity, the idea is that the price of oil may actually increase over time. So there's a real attraction to not producing your oil today because it may even be worth more tomorrow. Even if you don't believe in, in that pure model of scarcity, there's an attraction um, to rationing just in terms of it provides a very clear um, demonstration to, 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 your, um, to, to your population that you're using your resources in a way which is fair to future generations. No, you're not producing all the oil today. You're, you're producing the oil gradually over time. And so there's an intergenerational fairness associated with rationing, which is an important a driver in, in many parts um, of the world. But in a world of abundance, where some oil is going to be left under the ground, suddenly this type of oil strategy that looks far less appealing. And a shift to abundance could well lead to a shift to, a, to more competitive oil markets. As I said, in, this, in a world of abundance, rationing suddenly feels far less attractive. Why should I let the North Sea or Canada produce a barrel of oil today at five or ten times the cost of what I can produce it, if that increases the risk that my barrel of oil tomorrow may not get, um, may not get produced. That high reserves to production ratio perhaps no longer seems a sign of, of strength. In a world where some oil may never be produced, in a world of abundance where some oil may never be produced, surely it's better to have money in the bank than oil um, in, in the ground. And so this type of concern, I think, is likely to, to the, as this recognition that we're not in a world of scarcity, that perceived scarcity turned out to be wrong, and that we're increasingly moved to a world of abundance, is likely to shift to, to this more competitive oil market uh, place. In particular, we're likely to see a distribution of, the distribution of rents shift from resource owners to consumers as the market becomes more competitive. The key driver here is if you're a low-cost producer, the rational thing for you to do is to adopt a strategy of, of higher volumes, lower price, in order to squeeze out 
the, the high cost producers and gain market share for yourself. If there's only a certain amount of oil that's ever going to be consumed and there's too much of it, you want, you want to make sure it's yours. If you're the low cost producer, you can, you can afford to do that. For the high cost producers, their natural response in that type of world is to try to increasingly improve their fiscal and contract terms they offer um, to, to, inv to investors to make sure they get sufficient investment coming into their country in order to allow them to be able to produce their barrels of oil and make sure their barrels of oil are used. So we move to an increasingly competitive um, um, marketplace. And I think, in some sense, this is this is this will happen, this is likely to happen. It's in the idea of rationing and having these high reserve to production ratios becomes increasingly less attractive and would start to move to this type of world. The key issue is, is how quickly we do that. If, it, if these forces start to play out, how quickly are we likely to play out? And I think there are a number of factors which are likely to slow the pace at which this shift to more competitive markets happen. One of, one of the factors um, um, affect slowing the pace is just a pure operational constraint. Other than Saudi Arabia, or, or almost at no other uh, major oil producers has significant spare capacity. And so if they want to produce more, they will need to increase their, their, their levels of production. And this takes a significant amount of time. Um, suppose you're an oil producer producing 3 million barrels of, t of oil today and you want to increase your production to say 6 million barrels a day. So you would say you, produce, you reduce your reserves to production ratio from 80 years to 40 years. So 40 years feels a bit better than 80. So I want to increase my production ratio from 3 to 6 million barrels a day. To do that would take tens of billions of dollars and likely several decades to do. You can't do that overnight. It's a, it's a, it's a difficult um, process to do. So there's just an operational um, constraint. As a slight aside here, so this is a slight parenthesis sort of a comment here. If you want to produce more oil today, but you have an operational constraint which means you can't do that, as another way of achieving the same outcome would be to sell forward your future oil production. So I can't produce more today, but another way of making sure I sell my oil would be to sell forward my, my oil production now. Well, what does that look like? Well, it looks remarkably like an IPO of a national oil company. When you think about, if you think about the, the, what Saudi Aramco is thinking about at the moment in terms of a 5% IPO, that effectively is selling forward 5% of future oil streams and capitalizing that value um, today. So just as a parenthesis in terms of how, how an IPO can relate to this type of um, argument. So part of this is an operational constraint. It just takes time um, to, to be able to do this. But there's also a more, uh, there's a more significant structural uh, challenge. Adopting a higher volume, lower price strategy is likely to call, cause oil, oil revenues um, to fall. If large oil producers can no longer rely on oil revenues to provide the main source, their main source of income for the indefinite future, they need to start div diversifying their economies for a life beyond oil. And again, I would argue the most prominent example of a country responding on that way at the moment is indeed Saudi Arabia with its Vision 2030. It's by no means the only one, but it's the one that most people has looked at most carefully of, a, of an economy that is gradually, which is recognizing the need to start diversifying their economy and for life beyond oil. But we know from some countless examples in countless, in, in countless different types of environments that that this type of structural diversification, diversifying your economy, fundamental reforms of economic con economies, is a long and challenging process. This happens over several decades. It's not something you, can, you, you do over a, a period of a few years. So again, this is a long and slow process. The third component here is, for, for many um, uh, oil producing economies, that, that are, are diversing away from oil, they may find it difficult to find other industries uh, and sectors of the economy which are as lucrative as producing low-cost oil. So as they diversify their economies and become less dependent on oil, they may also need to adjust living standards to this life beyond oil. Again, adjustments of living standards is a difficult and delicate thing to do, and again, it's likely to take a relatively slow um, period uh, of time. So my argument here is 
even if people think all oh, this scarcity arguments are, are old hat, and we've all realized that, that, that it no longer holds, the behavior of the oil markets today suggests something different. And it suggests that at least in terms of behaviors today, and, and I could, we could observe levels of production relative to ratios, there is still a significant amount of rationing going on. My argument is, as people increasingly accept the recognition that we're living and moving to a world of more and more abundance, there's a number of challenges that this poses um, to oil producing economies. One is the, the fact they may just need to shift their operational constraints to start producing more. But at the same time, there's also these far deeper structural issues that they also need to start the urgency they have in terms of diversifying, the, diversifying their economies for a world for life beyond oil becomes even, uh, even um, greater. But these things take time, and so it's likely to be a relatively slow um, process. Okay, so what does all this mean for long-run um, oil prices? In, in particular, if you like, the question is, what determines oil prices in an age of abundance? And the reason I pose the question that way um, at least because of people of a certain age, um, when we all went to school, the textbook model we learned about what determines oil prices um, was based on a world where oil was an exhaustible resource. So th this is the, the, the famous model which dates back to Harold Hotelling. And that model, um, and the Hotelling model, was based explicitly on the idea that oil would be exhausted. And so if you were an, an holder of oil resources, the only question you had to face was not whether you had to compete with somebody else to make sure your oil was produced. All you had to think about was what was the optimal rate at which you extracted that, price, um, that, that oil. And in the very simplistic, highly simplified version of the hoteling model, you had this really beautiful intuitive result that the oil price would rise in line with the real interest rate over time. And the intuition for that result was very straightforward in the sense of if I'm an oil producer, I can do one of two things. I can produce my oil today and put it in the bank and earn the real interest rate, or I can produce my oil um, tomorrow. I got to be indifferent between those two strategies. The only way I can be indifferent between those two strategies is to the price of oil to rise in line um, with the real interest rate. That's all great, beautiful model, all works lovely in a world where oil is exhaustible, and all I'm talking, thinking about is the optimal rate of extraction. But in a world of abundance, what determines oil prices in a world where we're never going to run out of oil? Well, the textbook model, a simple way of thinking about this, well, as the market becomes more and more competitive, what do we know about competitive markets? I would expect the price um, to start to fall towards the, the cost of producing the marginal barrel of oil. That's sort of what we know in terms of economics in a competitive market. The price will start to equate close to the marginal cost, um, to the marginal barrel of oil. And just to give you a sense of that, some est estimates uh, given to me by Reistad Energy, they estimate that in the last year, around 40% of oil production um, 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 had a, a cost of production of, of $15 or less. So taken at face value, this suggests that, well, as these low-cost producers start to get increasing market share, this could suggest that oil prices could fall really quite sharply, really quite significantly over time as markets become more, more significant and these low-cost producers get bigger and bigger uh, market share. But I'm not sure it should be taken at face value. And I think the problem of doing this, it, it, it risks uh, ignoring a very significant other aspect of, of oil producing economies. And, and the point here is, in most oil producing um, economies of the world, um, the oil revenues play a major role in, sub in financing the whole broad structure of the economy. Oil revenues are used as a predominant source of providing health um, provision, education provision, high levels of, of public sector um, employment. Oil revenues often account for 80 or 90% of total government um, revenues. If oil prices fell to a level which only covered the cost of extraction, those economic structures, those economies would be unstable. So when thinking about the future, what determines oil prices, we need to take account of the physical cost of, of, um, of production, but we also need to take account of these wider social costs of production, which support 
the fabric, the, the broader fabric um, of, 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 of society. And both of these things, um, uh, it's important to think about both of these things when, we, when, when thinking about what would determine oil prices in the long run. So it, prices may well start to go down to the marginal cost of production, but that, mar that marginal cost, I will argue, for oil producing economies has two components to it. It has its physical cost, but it has also has this wider, um, I, uh, this wider um, social cost, which without which these economies would be unstable. Okay, so how big are these social costs of production? Are they worth worrying about? How should we think about these social costs of production? So a relatively simplistic way, and I will, I will hold up my hands up and say there are many reasons why this is not the perfect way of doing it, but it's the only way I could think of, of, of trying to get a handle on it, would be to compare the cost of extraction with estimates of um, the fiscal break-even oil price in these economies. So for those of you who aren't familiar with fiscal break-even prices, these are estimates, um, I'm going to use estimates produced by the IMF, which work out what is the oil price needed in any given year to make sure that the, the, the fiscal um, deficit in the economy um, balances. So if I take, for example, so what I've done here is taken the five major uh, Middle Eastern um, producers in the world, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, uh, Iran, Iraq, and Kuwait. And, and the most recent IMF estimates um, estimate that the fiscal break-even price, the average fiscal break-even price in, the, in those economies is around $60. That compares with a cost of extraction of $10, and in fact, significantly less in, in, many, of these, um, uh, in many of these economies. As I said, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to explain to you all the reasons why um, the fiscal break-even price isn't the perfect measure, but it's good enough to give us a sense that social costs in many of these economies are likely to be many, many times greater than the cost of extraction. So when you're just thinking about what's the driver here, what's the big number, these social costs are likely to be many times greater than, than, than the, physical, the physical cost of extraction, and so we should be, um, they're important to think about them. Now, these social costs are likely to decline as these economies diversify. So as, as economies diversify, the economic base gets broader, and so there's a broader economic base to support the economy. The economy becomes less dependent on oil, and so these social costs will naturally fall. It will naturally happen as these economies diversify. But as I just argued, this process of economic diversification and, and, and economic reform are long and slow processes. So that suggests that these social costs are likely to remain high for, for a significant period of time. So these social costs are big, and the factors which have caused them to get smaller are slow, are, are, slow, are slow moving, and therefore these social costs are likely to be significant for a significant period of time. So how does all this relate to long-run oil prices, and, and, and why, why am I talking about this? What does it mean for long-run oil prices? My argument is that um, for a simple point, for, for sustainable equilibrium, the oil price, when thinking about where the oil price will settle down, the oil price needs to take account of, of, of the total cost of production, the physical cost of production, as well as the social cost of production. If oil, oil prices don't cover those social costs of production, we're not going to have a stable equilibrium. Either we'll have oil producers running very large um, fiscal deficits, large and persistent fiscal deficits, or we'd be having to see those oil producers having to make repeated reductions in, in, in social um, uh, provisions. Neither of those are consistent with there being um, a stable equilibrium. And indeed, the recognition of this means that many large oil producers may uh, delay adopting this more competitive strategy, this, this, this more competitive, higher volume, lower price strategy, until they've made progress in reforming their economies. This competitive strategy doesn't happen on its own accord. It will only happen if a critical mass of low cost producers want to start competing in this way. For, for, those, for a critical mass of low cost producers to start competing in this way, two things need to happen. One, they need to have the recognition they still need to start doing this. 
But secondly, they need to have made sufficient progress in terms of reforming their economies. They can start this sort of process in a sustainable way. You can't start this process if you know it's going to lead to persistent fiscal deficits or all sorts of problems in terms of reducing social um, um, provision. And for that reason, my instinct is that when thinking about um, uh, the, the determination of oil prices over the next 20, 20 or 30 years, a really significant factor which will determine oil prices over the next 20 years is the, is the success of these oil producers in reforming their economies and their success of these economies in, in reducing their levels of social cost. Indeed, to take this just one step further, Thinking of it in this way even begs the question of what's really meant by a low-cost producer. So when I started uh, this talk, I sort of framed this thing about low-cost producers gaining market share relative to high-cost producers. And in, and in our heads, I had this view that low-cost producers, like, like in the Middle East, some of those Saudi Arabia, UAE, those other countries I mentioned, gaining market share relative to high-cost producers such as Canada or... or, 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 or um, or, or the North Sea. But ultimately, the ability of a producer to, 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 to impart on, in that type of um, th competitive strategy um, um, we, we depends on the total cost of production. And so it, will only be, it was only possible for those low physical cost of extraction uh, countries to do this if they're successful in, in reducing their social costs. If they're not successful in reducing their social costs, they may actually lose out to far more diversified, low, um, uh, less oil-dependent economies, even if the costs of extraction in those economies are significantly greater, they may not be as big as 60 or $70, which is what the social cost is in the other ones. And so who wins this competitive game suddenly may not be what, what, what we think it is, or who has the comparative advantage in this competitive game may not be quite who we um, think it, um, um, it is uh, at first blush. Okay. Um, uh, let me uh, try and bring this to a close so I actually um, uh, follow Rob's advice in terms of following, uh, stopping on time and get you to your peanuts and um, imperial crisps. Um, so what have I tried to argue today? First of all, I've argued um, when oil, this current um, sort of fixation on guessing when oil demand will peak is not very interesting. Um, when oil demand will peak, I don't know, and nor does anybody else know, and moreover, is not very interesting. Even when oil demand peaks, the world is likely to consume significant amounts of oil for many decades after oil demand has peaked. That's not why oil peak oil demand is interesting. Rather, I would argue, peak oil demand is interesting because it signals this shift in paradigm, this sh paradigm shift away from an age of scarcity to an age, to an age of abundance. And that shift is likely to lead to a more competitive global oil market. And, that, and it leads to a more competitive global oil market because it's increasingly realized that if some people's oil is going to be left in the ground, I don't want it to be mine. So the current rationing strategy where I carry on producing this oil for 70, 80, 90 years increasingly looks not a smart thing to do. But the pace at which we get to that more competitive um, oil market is a function of the success in, in, in economies in diversifying their economies and reducing their social costs. That's what matters here. And what that means is, when thinking about the determination of oil prices over the next 20 or 30 years, we should pay significant attention in how successful these economies are being in reforming their economies and reducing their social costs. And my hunch is that's likely to be, have a far more important determination of oil prices over this period than, than simply the physical costs um, of extraction. Let me stop there. Thank you. Okay, great. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, um, Spencer's going to chair questions uh, himself, so I'm, I'm not going to stay down here uh, Dimbleby style. Um, the, the only thing is uh, we are recording this, uh, so there, there are a couple of microphones, and I understand that we've got a couple of mic runners, and I don't know who they are because I didn't think to check, so I hope they know who they are. Okay. <laughs>
So if you uh, if you have a question uh, and you you get picked, to, could you wait for the mic, and could you say your name and your affiliation, please? Thanks very much. Sir, thank you. John Gibbons, UK CCS Research Centre. I think you're assuming that I don't. Maybe I missed it. That we're not going to be able to burn the second half of the oil, extractable oil in the second half of the century because of CO2 emission limitations. Is that, is that correct? Uh, it's, I'm, what I'm assuming is that most people will recognize that oil demand is going to peak and it will slowly decline. And so all I'm assuming is that people aren't confident. <coughs> well, let me put it in a different way, actually. I think this is what I'm assuming. I was in a, a Middle Eastern economy recently that has a reserve to production ratio of 90 years. And I said to somebody very senior in the government there, do you think a barrel of oil in 90 years' time will be as valuable as a barrel of oil today? And they said, no, of course not. So I said, well, why do you have an oil to production ratio of 90 years? That's what I'm assuming. But you don't know why they thought not? Um, I think because, because two things are going on. There's a big, because climate change action is inc intensifying, and that's causing these things to, 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 to turn down. Even more importantly, we're using uh, energy more and more efficiently. And so, the, you know, in some sense, um, what's the biggest driver of this slowing in oil demand over the next 20 years in transport? It's not electric vehicles. By an order of magnitude, literally by an order of magnitude more important, it's improving vehicle efficiency. Mm -hmm. and, and we will get better and better. And so I think, so we have, a st I think, under very plausible scenarios, that you will see oil demand um, start to plateau, start to uh, gradually decline. And, and it's, so, yes, so the story here is a combination of, of, of climate change, increasing concerns about climate change, technical improvements, innovation, consistent with the sort of work that Dennis Anderson would do, would make you pretty confident or uh, you would ex expect that some of that oil won't be extracted and, and all that, oh, that's all I need to, to, to for, the, for my argument to go through. So the, the question, real question then is, what price would you have to be able to offset those emissions with, I guess, direct air capture as the backstop to change your conclusions about that oil being unburnable? So I don't, yes. So, it's, so if, we could, if we could actually get to a world where we could, on mass scale, well, I think, yes, I mean, that's a game, I think that's obviously a game changer. So, 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 so that's a game changer in terms of all fossil fuels in some sense. I, uh, I still think I'd be nervous about just the improvements in energy efficiency that, that somehow that I will be, a, yeah, so I, th I think, yes. So if we move to that world, then some of my arguments uh, decline. I think I'm happy to give the probability matter that to a relative, I mean, it'd be wonderful if that were the case in terms of many other things, and I'd be more than happy for my lecture to be wrong um, if that were the case. But yes, I am assuming that, we, that, that climate change continues, that we don't find a, a, a magic solution to, to, to the climate change issue, and so therefore we will increasingly see both, both by direct policies in terms of carbon pricing and indirect policies like encouragement of electric vehicles, a sh an encouragement a shift away from oil and gas and coal towards cleaner, lower carbon fuels. Uh, the lady right in the middle, literally right in the middle, I think. Hi, um, Vicky Baxter from BMO Global Asset Management. Um, electric vehicles, I'm going to ask again. Um, it, I, the impression I get from what you say, although I don't know what's in all the scenarios, is that you're envisaging a fairly linear adoption of electric vehicles, which doesn't move the dial much even by 2040. What's the possibility, do you think there's a possibility of a more kind of a tipping point where you get exponential adoption of that technology driven by government policy, driven by cost reductions in electric vehicles, and that at some point in time, that becomes so obvious and apparent that there's a kind of panicked shift towards that strategy you mentioned of increased volume, reduced price to get the maximum amount of the remaining reserves. And therefore, you could actually get quite a, a, a sort of a fast, rapid uh, change in the oil price scenario based on the anticipation of that rapid take up of electric vehicles. Yeah, so uh, I guess there's two arguments here um, I mean, in one. Uh, it's not linear. 
uh, my profile for electric vehicles here, it's highly nonlinear and it, it's going up massively. It's just, um, so just a sort of rough orders of magnitude. So there's about, um, so today I, I talked about 95 million barrels of oil being consumed. 20, of those, 20 million of those goes into cars. Okay, so 75 go elsewhere. So even if we wipe out all cars tomorrow, there'll still be demand for 75 million barrels of oil. There's about a billion cars on the planet today. So about a billion cars um, consume about 20 million barrels of oil. So that's about 100 million cars can consume about uh, 2 million barrels of oil. My best guess when I go out to 2035 is that the, the, the guess we made earlier this year was the number of electric cars in 2035 would rise from about 3 million today to about 100 million in, in, um, in, in, in 2035. So that has a co growth rate of around 20% a year. Now, how confident are I about that estimate? I'm not at all confident, for goodness sake. I mean, I have no idea um, what will happen to electric cars over this, this period. But that reduction in electric cars, assuming that vehicles get more efficient, would reduce oil demand by about one and a half million barrels a day. So suppose I'm really wrong. Double it, triple it. It's going to reduce oil demand by four or five million barrels a day. Remember that chart I showed you? It was an oil demand at today at 95 million barrels a day going to 110 120 million barrels a day. You have to have the most progressive um, um, uh, uh, projections I've seen from sort of, uh, of, oil, or, of um, EVs um, ha have oil demand being reduced by less than 10 million barrels a day out to 2040. I, I sort of just don't think it's a game changer. Um, and these are really progressive, really progressive uh, changes. Um, uh, um, the other question is, uh, but you also have a sort of two-part question is, suppose these guys just suddenly got really scared. Could they, start, could they go for this very rapidly? The problem with this strategy of going for it really rapidly, suppose I have a fiscal break-even rate of $70. And suppose I think, well, the best way I can actually maximize my revenue is selling all my oil at 40. That may well be the ma revenue-maximizing strategy but I can't do it because I can't start selling all my oil at $40 a barrel because I'd just be running massive fiscal deficits. Um, and, and, and I can't do that in indefinite, for an indefinite way. And, and moreover, who would ever fund a fiscal deficit if they realized that I was selling all my wealth and, and running up debt? So I, I think there's a sort of, there's just a sort of just a structural Sort of, I'm not, I'm, this is a room of engineers, so I'm not going to use feedback. But there's a structural mechanism here which you can't really do, you can't embark on this sort of strategy until you've got your economy in a position that is consistent with it, because otherwise you're just very rapidly going to have to um, um, either run very large persistent deficits or re reduce, reduce wholesale. The, the level of, of sort of social support you provide for your for your economy, either either of those, doesn't seem to me sort of an equilibrium. And, and in that world, I guess my the loop here is, if it's not an equilibrium and this leads to instability, then that's likely to feed back to oil production, which is likely to lead to prices going up. Uh, you know, you can't oil prices don't stay low if most of the major oil producers in the world are in an unstable equilibrium where they where they look like. Um, they're, they're sort of on a sort of economic path which is unstable. And sort of that's the sort of macro feedback I've sort of, I guess I'm arguing that many people when thought about, when they think, when they thought about this, they've just sort of taken the simple, well, in a more competitive environment, we go down to a low cost price, the price of producing oil is very cheap, so that's where oil price is gonna go. And I just worry, or, or I guess my argument is, I don't think, that type of argument takes account of this sort of structural feedback, which, which I think is sort of quite important. I just said feedback, so apologies for engineers. I, I know now I don't understand feedback loops, so don't tell me um, I got it wrong, I know. Um, I got a question at the front here, and then I got a question uh, halfway up. Um, hi, so my question is about um, national oil companies and their, their rise over the last few decades. So in um, more international oil companies, so the likes of BP and Shell, et cetera, have kind of declined massively in um, production uh, capacity. 
So I mean, in 80% um, of the world's hydrocarbon resources in the 1970s were controlled by these companies, now it's 8%. So um, my, my question is, what role do you see for these international oil companies in the future, if they're declining in importance? So um, that fact in itself is a really amazing fact, isn't it? I, I use this fact um, sometimes when, when people say, you know, what are you going to do about all these issues? And you say, well, take the five super majors. What proportion of oil supply do you think they um, produce? And people say, oh, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 percent. And it's, it's less than 10 percent. So it just puts you into, into context. Um, I'm not here um, to be a sort of advocate or pro to do adverts for international oil companies. There are people far better than I. I think the issue here, so what the real challenge this poses are for people, for very significant resource owners. People with reserves to production ratios of 70, 80, 90 years. The average reserve to production ratio of an international oil company is about 10 or 12 years. In some sense, you could argue, and I'm now going to sound like an advert for BP, you could argue that, that we're okay in this world because what we've got is capital, and our capital's mobile. And so in this world, there are going to be winners and losers. Some people will be able to restructure their economy and therefore um, start to be able to play that competitive gain, increase market share. Others won't. Those who want to increase the levels of production are, are unlikely to be able to do it all on their own. And therefore, um, in, in that world, um, they may well need help and support. That's what international oil companies, we're known for help and support. That's what international oil companies do. They go and help and support countries who wish to um, extract um, um, their oil. So I, I'm not suggesting this is a bonanza for international oil companies. I mean, I'm telling you a story where it's peak oil demand, so this is hardly a, a, you know, a, 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 a sort of recruiting call. But I think the, the challenge posed by this, for the argument I'm doing here, is the challenges to, to people who, have, who own very significant amounts of oil resources. And people who, who are relatively flexible are the opposite. And so in some sense, if you like, the key one here is, up till now, a high reserve to production ratio has been seen by everybody as a sign of strength. Venezuela has a reserve to production ratio of 300 years. Sign of strength? or a sign of somebody who's got lots of assets which, are, which, which may be really difficult to monetize. And, and I think that's the sort of way I, th I think about this. Uh, it, there is also an issue with expense. Well, there's many issues with Venezuela, uh, which I'm not going to try and get into here. Um, a gentleman here, and then I'll come back to the... Uh, the so one, one uh, gentleman there, and I've got two at the front, and then Rob, I'm going to tell you, can, I will carry on until you tell me not to. Uh, Nick Bevan from Bayes. Um, are you going to be bu buying Saudi Aramco shares? Let me say that when I'm not on camera, um, 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 enjoying um, Imperial Crisps. Uh, thank you very much for the very nice lecture. I, I, we're sitting in an intellectual environment here, doing research. Oil is called black gold over the years, and it whitened itself when it moved to petrochemicals. Don't you see it should go back to being related to gold? In other words, price, things like that. Do you want to comment on that? So you want me to say the price? It's precious. Mendeleev, who is the periodic table the chemist, said oil should, is so precious it shouldn't be burned. That's 120 years ago. It took the world about 60 years to make it not from burning into uh, transportation, et cetera, to actually part of it moved into the petrochemical industry. It may be, what do you think? So I'm gonna I reveal my ignorance here. Um, so first of all, I'm, my history is appalling and, and I'm not a chemist. And so I'm, econ I'm an economist. And so what an economist would do, there's nothing intrinsically valuable about anything. The, the, the value of something is, is is it, you know, how sort of deeply valuable something is, is what, what price are people willing to pay for it? What socially useful function um, does oil um, perform? My argument is that it performs a pretty significant socially valuable function at the moment given current technology because it's pretty hard to displace the role that oil plays in transport. Over time, 
electrification, the use of natural gas in long road, haul, road haulage, hydrogen may uh, gradually allow for, for a gradual, imp uh, will, will gradually penetrate that, that transport system. But at the moment, oil plays a very significant role. But I think the price it, it should demand should be determined by how successful it plays that role and the competition in others. I don't think, I, d I don't want to look at it, and what I, I don't want to take it home and put a jar on my windowsill and use it as a piece of art. I mean, I, I'll use it if it's helpful, but if it's not helpful and something else can do the job more cheaply, more efficiently, or more c or cleaner, um, then, then we should displace oil and the price of oil will, will decline. And I think the, we should let, I th if in some sense, I would nearly say we should let the market determine. I don't think we should let the market purely determine this. I think we should let the market determine with this, with the appropriate carbon price reflecting the, the externalities associated with oil and gas relative to other fuels. And um, that's, that's an obvious economics point to make, but it's a point that BP has made consistently um, as well. Uh, Dr. Fala al uh, advisor in the Iraqi oil ministry, former governor of Iraq, OPEC. Uh, so you can now correct everything I just said. <laughs> I thank you for this uh, really uh, fruitful uh, presentation. I have a uh, uh, certain question, and maybe you can help me with, with it. Is first, the question regarding the tax, uh, uh, the tax imposed in, uh, in European uh, countries and maybe America, uh, which is in, especially in this country above 75% uh, uh, that any uh, barrel uh, consumed here. And in Europe, uh, some of them 50, some of them 60%. Uh, do you? feel that this has certain effect on the consumption of oil and peak oil? This is the first uh, question. Um, and also later on, on uh, the technology, there is any link technology between CO2 technology, I mean, storage and c capture and storage uh, CO2. I mean, if there is technology improved, then the tax should be uh, reduced. The second thing is the gas. What's the relation in the future? There is. Um, eight years ago, I was uh, attending a presentation between OPEC and uh, European Commission, um, and the presentation said that uh, in uh, 2040, uh, there will be a, a huge reduction in oil consumption, but in the benefit of gas. So do you, today there is no mention to the gas. Do you feel there is uh, some connection between the two and the uh, two until two th 2040? So uh, oh, the third one. Oh, okay, yeah, the third one is IEA. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to the first chart, which is a, a, a proposal by many entities, especially uh, OPEC and uh, IEA, uh, most of them the, they cont um, they propose that the oil consumption or the oil demand will be increased, except if you see the uh, chart IEA, which is. Uh, from 30, 2035 to, to 40 and continue decline. What's different yeah. uh, that, what the model used yeah. by uh, okay. this, uh, so uh, thank you very much. Let me ask that last one first. So the IEA 450 scenario, so the 450 is, we know parts per million in terms of it, so it, it is, it's a sort of, the, the question is, is not what I think is likely to happen, they're asking a different question in that scenario. They're saying, what would need to happen to the energy system in order for the overall energy system, the carbon emissions for the overall energy system to decline at a rate which the IEA judged to be consistent with having a good chance of hitting the two degree scenario. So in some sense, it's a backcast rather than a forecast. It's, it's a, what would I need to happen? And many, many, many things would need to happen one of which is you need to get oil production down. So under this scenario, they sort of assume um, very, very significant improvements in vehicle efficiency. They assume very significant take up in electric vehicles. In some sense, they don't have to say how they get that. They just they say that's what would need to happen. And in some sense, you use that as a sort of guide to telling you the challenges in associated with achieving that type of outcome. So it's not a prediction, it's a sort of, this is what needs to happen uh, discussion. On, I think the, qu the second question is, do we see, I think, I, th I think one way of answering your question on gas is, do I see a penetration of gas in the transportation system? And the answer is yes. Um, in our best, our, when we looked at the outlook, uh, in, in our most recent outlook, 
we had the pace at which gas penetrated the energy system being twice as, you know, increasing at twice the rate than electricity. So all the discussions about power and the, the transport system is electric cars, electric cars, electric cars. Um, we had gas um, penetrating the transport system twice as much in electricity, not within um, cars, in the, within passenger vehicles, but predominantly within um, long road haulage uh, and also marine um, transportation. And what's sort of special about um, those two sectors. A, that long road haulage means it's pretty hard to electrify. I, I, I saw the Tesla lorry as well. I think it's pretty hard to electrify uh, long road, road haulage and marine um, transportation. And the good thing about those types of, 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 um, um, uh, of long road haulage in terms of either road or, or marine is they tend to go from one fixed point to another fixed point. So you don't need a massive distribution of um, infrast uh, like petrol stations throughout the country. You just need a filling station at the beginning and the end of the journey, and you can do it relatively well. Somebody some showed me analysis that you, to cover sort of 90% of, uh, of lorry routes in, in the US, you would need only hundreds of filling stations, not thousands or tens of thousands, it's hundreds of filling stations. And so we do that. And for example, um, uh, in China at the moment, there's a phenomenal uh, growth of gas within long road, road haulage with, company, with many, many people converting diesel trucks to um, gas trucks with a payback period of less than a year at the moment that partly government in incentivized, but significant issue here. And um, uh, if I would add one tiny advert for BP, we, we are working on our, our new energy outlook, which we will publish in, in February of next year. And I hope to try and think about as well as some electric vehicle issues, try and think more generally about the penetration of all sorts of energies within the, the transportation system to highlight that it's not just electricity, there's, there's a role for gas and, and other fuels as well. On the, on the th oil tax, it is certainly the case that uh, petrol is taxed very significantly and, um, and that high levels of taxation affects levels of demand. I agree with both of those statements. I also think it's consistent with the view that um, there's an externality associated with oil in terms, of, um, um, in terms of the impact it has on the environment. And so in some sense, there should be a taxation. What I haven't seen any analysis on is whether the level of taxation in the UK compared to, say, the level of taxation in the US, the implied carbon price is anywhere near the sensible carbon price. I, I genuinely have no idea what the implied carbon price is and whether that's a sensible one. I, my hunch is the reason why oil um, is taxed very heavily is the demand for it, particularly in cars, is very inelastic. And what we know in terms of taxation is I like taxing things where demand is very inelastic. And my hunch is that's why the price is very high. Um, if we're going to think about um, the good thing about carbon pricing is it allows um, the energy system, provides an incentive for the energy system to reduce carbon in the most efficient way. And the, and the best way of doing that is charging the same price on carbon across all types of things, rather than just, pick, just saying, well, this one thing is relatively demand inelastic, so let's do the tax out a lot. This one relatively demand elastic, so we won't do it. So I, my instinct would be um, some form of taxation is right, whether it's appropriate, whether that level is the right one, and it, it's less, far less clear to me. How long, I've got one more question. Oh, I, this is horrible. Uh, well, here's a deal. I'm going to stay around eating crisps for a while. Um, this gentleman here has been very um, patient. So I'm going to give it to this gentleman here. Um, I will stand here for a few minutes. Anybody wants to do anything there, or we can do it over a glass of wine um, next door.